Greetings, fellow Top 10 Trends Warriors. Today, we'll be sharpening our swords and girding our loins as we take a look at the 10 most badass medieval weapons I could find. Number 10, the flail. Now, a flail actually refers to two different weapons, a long two-handed infantry weapon with a cylindrical head and a much shorter one, the one you're familiar with, with a round metal striking head. The defining characteristic of both is that they involve a separate striking head attached to a handle by a rope or chain. The tactical virtue of the flail was its capacity to strike around a defender's shield or parry. Its chief liability is a lack of precision. But let's just say for the sake of argument that you're dealing with someone who knows how to use a flail. How do you stop them? Or explain to me how you stop a guy who's swinging a flail around his head, right? You've got a shield, you've got a sword, you put the shield up, boom, your hand's broken, done. It's gonna swing around, crush your hand. You put the sword up, you've now lost your sword. Chain's gonna wrap around it, he's gonna either yank it out of your hand, break the sword in half, or the flail's gonna smash your hand into pulp. How do you kill a guy with a flail? I'm not sure. That's why it's so dangerous. The flail we're all familiar with is the ball and chain flail, but there is a type of flail that has a long handle called the peasant flail. The ball and chain flail is sometimes accidentally labeled a mace or morning star, which only applies to the rigid version of the weapon. You know, the pointy ball on top of a metal stick. Even though this weapon is actually really common in like cartoons and films, there's not a whole lot of historical information about the flail. Some people doubt they existed at all due to the number of pieces sifting in museums that turned out to be forgeries. Archaeologically, however, a type of military flail known as a kistin is attested in the 10th century in the territory of the Rus, probably being adopted by either the Avars or the Khazars. This weapon spread into Central Europe in the 11th and 13th centuries, and is considered the ancestor of the ball and chain flail. Number 9. The Culverin. A culverin was a relatively simple ancestor of the musket, and later the medieval cannon, adapted for use by the French in the 15th century. I bet you didn't know that the medieval ages had guns, but they did. The culverin was used to bombard targets from a distance. The weapon had a relatively long barrel and a light construction. The culverin fired solid round shot projectiles with a high muzzle velocity, producing a relatively long range and flat trajectory. They fired a shot similar to a cannonball. The term culverin is derived from the Latin culbrinius, or the nature of a snake. It was originally the name of a medieval ancestor of the musket. The hand culverin consisted of a simple, smooth tube, closed at one end except for a small hole designed to allow ignition of the gunpowder. The tube was held in place by a wooden piece which could be held under the arm. The tube was loaded with gunpowder and lead bullets. You had to insert a match into the hole to fire it. After hand culverins were developed and seen as a potential weapon, larger versions of the culverin called field culverins were used. These are basically the grandfathers of cannons. Culverins are also known as bombards and were frequently used by the Spanish. Number eight, scalding oil. Sometimes the most simplistic solution is the best. Oftentimes, when soldiers would siege castles, they would get stuck between two gates. Above these gates are what are known as murder holes. They're called murder holes because as the soldiers tried to desperately get out from between the two gates, enemy soldiers, the ones defending the castle, would dump boiling hot oil into the murder holes, killing anyone below. Boiling oil was also used to dump off of walls. In general, it made for a great anti-siege technique. It's also a great psychological weapon. No one wants to die because someone dumped a cauldron of boiling oil on them. I'd rather just get cut in half with a sword or stabbed in the face, thanks. Outside of sieges, boiling oil was used to light entire towns and villages on fire. Oftentimes, these were used against enemy structures and the territory. Sometimes personnel, like I said during a siege, but usually against towns themselves. Large tracts of land, towns, and villages were frequently ignited as part of a scorched earth strategy. But yeah, boiling oil, not a fun way to die. Number seven, the Hunga Munga. Yes, it's real. The Hunga Munga, or the Mambale, is a form of knife in mid to South Africa but was originally a curved throwing dagger used by the Mangbetu. It consists of an iron blade with a curved back section and a rearward spike. It can be used in close combat as a hatchet or dagger, or more typically thrown. The weapon usually consists of the weapon usually consists of four blades, three on top and one on the side. The curved hook was used to keep the weapon in the victim, and if pulled out, caused further damage. These are about 22 inches in length. These African iron weapons were thrown in a rotary motion to inflict deep wounds with their projecting blades. There's no way to catch it once it's been thrown, kind of like a boomerang. It just spins and it's blade in all direction. So if it hits you, it's gonna hurt. These knives reflect the culture of Africa before colonization, both through their design and use. They can be symmetrical, bulbous, or even multi-pronged. Many are made of rarer and softer materials. 
These were harder to forge and were a status symbol to their owners. Like a gold AK. Number six, a trebuchet. The classic trebuchet is a type of siege engine most frequently used in the Middle Ages. It is sometimes called a counterweight trebuchet to distinguish it from an earlier weapon called the traction trebuchet. The counterweight trebuchet appeared in both Christian and Muslim lands around the Mediterranean in the 12th century. It was most commonly used to fling projectiles weighing between 110 pounds and 220 pounds at or into enemy fortifications located over 1,000 feet away, and its use continued into the 15th century century, well after gunpowder was invented. Trebuchets are so useful because you can set them up from about a thousand feet away and destroy a castle with it. The enemy can't do anything. Bows can't reach that far. So they just sit there and get annihilated by a trebuchet. The downside is, if the enemy decides to sally forth or ride out from the castle, a trebuchet has to be unpacked to be set up and used, which means in order to move, it has to be packed up again. You better be damn sure you don't have to move it quickly, because you're not going to be able to. Number five, Hellburner. Hellburners were specialized fire ships used in the siege of Antwerp during the 80 years war between the Dutch rebels and the Habsburgs. They were, they were floating bombs, also called Antwerp fire, and did immense damage to the Spanish besiegers. Hellburners have been described as an early form of weapons of mass destruction. The events of Antwerp gave the Hellburners an immediate notoriety. The concept generated enormous interest with military experts all over Europe. The fire ships sent against the Spanish Armada on the 7th of August in 1588 were taken to be Hellburners because, because instead of being small, typical fire ships, they were eight massive warships that were being sacrificed for the attack. They actually weren't as deadly as a regular fire ship, but they were successful in breaking the fleet's formation and their morale, their mistaken identity contributing to the panic. Number four, a man catcher. A man catcher is an esoteric type of pole weapon that was used in Europe as late as the 18th century. It consisted of a pole mounted with a two-pronged head. Each prong was semicircular in shape with a spring-loaded door on the front. This created an effective valve that would allow the ring to pass around a man-sized cylinder and keep it trapped. The man catcher was used primarily to pull a person from a horse and drag them to the ground where they could be helplessly pinned. This is one of the very few examples of non-lethal pole arms. Man catchers played a role in the medieval custom of capturing noble opponents for ransom. This design assumes that the captured person wears armor to protect them against the metal prongs, which could easily hurt the neck of a person without armor. The man catcher was also used to trap and contain violent prisoners. Number three, the Chinese repeating crossbow. The repeating crossbow, also known as the Zuge crossbow, due to the design upgrade contributed by the Three Kingdoms era strategist Zuge Liang, in 200 AD is an ancient Chinese crossbow where the separate actions of the stringing the bow, placing the bolt, and shooting it can be accomplished with a simple one-handed movement while keeping the crossbow stationary. This allows a much higher rate of fire than a normal crossbow. There's a mounted magazine containing a reservoir of bolts that are fed by gravity, and the mechanism is worked by simply moving a rectangular lever forward and backward. Repeating crossbows date back all the way to 200 AD. However, repeating crossbows were introduced into Korea in the 1400s, so they were still being used for quite a long time. Number two, lantern shield. This Dark Souls looking device is a small shield combined with a lantern used during the Italian Renaissance especially for nighttime duels. A number of them survived. Their defining feature is a small circular shield, a buckler, combined with a lantern or a hook from which to hang a lantern, intended to blind the opponent at night or in duels fought at dawn. Some more elaborate examples incorporate gauntlets, spikes, sword blades, and a mechanism to darken or release the light of the lantern. This weapon, however, wasn't really used for soldiers. It was more used by town guards and individual duelists who would keep watch at night or fight during night. And number one, the number one favorite most badass medieval weapon is Greek fire and the many iterations of it. Now, original Greek fire is obviously from before the medieval ages, but Greek fire would be passed down over and over again. And even though true Greek fire was lost, many similar recipes were made. So Greek fire, what does it do? Well, you light it on fire and you're now burning like napalm. It can't be put out and it'll burn for a couple hours. So you're pretty much dead. Now, Greek fire is bad, but it kind of sounds like boiling oil, right? I mean, you have to dump it on someone. Wrong. 
Greek fire was often used in combination with ancient pumps called siphons, which would spray Greek fire over 40 feet. Yeah, so can you say medieval flamethrower? Because they existed. In fact, they existed all the way back into Grecian times. Whether it be on warships or castles or wooden structures, anything that can burn people was subject to Greek fire, especially when it was put into a flamethrower. Well, gang, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did like the video, give it a like down below. And if you want to see more content, subscribe. I hope you guys are having a great day. What's your favorite medieval weapon? Bye-bye.